there and uh, most recently recovered from COVID. A fun fact for everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you very much to TASC for the invitation to speak and, and talk about um, what we're doing with MANA um, and you know where it sits in an Irish and tech and investment context. And uh, so, so just a little bit about me, if you don't uh, know, I'm a techie uh, programmer um, and a programmer that builds businesses. I've built uh, quite a few uh, tech businesses in Ireland, mostly software businesses, and most recent one being Car Trawler, before that Eland, all, all of which were uh, based at headquartered and, and all of the growth in Ireland. And uh, we've done a very good job, me and the, the team that are with me now in MANA, um, at doing that. Um, MANA or MANA Drone Delivery uh, is a business that I founded about three years ago, just less than three years ago, uh, with the express purpose of creating a delivery network for communities, suburban and rural communities to move uh, products around, to move light, lightweight, relatively low value products around communities from everywhere to everybody in the community. So delivery service that, that will travel about 80 kilometers per hour and carry products from commercial retailers or local producers to directly to consumers' homes in suburban and rural contexts. Um, we've designed and built our own aircraft, which you see the original version behind me. So it's like the old aircraft. And we've actually on our fourth iteration of aircraft now. We designed that here in Ireland. We build them here in Ireland and we build all the um, software, the tech stack, both for the avionics, the aircraft itself, and the middleware or the, the web services that our commercial partners use. Um, we are VC backed. Uh, we've raised just over $30 million in venture capital funding, um, mostly uh, from the UK, actually our most recent investment round led by uh, Draper Esprit um, and, and prior to that some US based VCs. And I'm proud to say some Irish based VCs as well. So a loss making, uh, very high risk, very high reward type of technology um, business and you know, reflective of what I think is the most important uh, part of our tech and jobs future in Ireland. It, it's a high risk, well-backed startup with a strong local team creating jobs and creating intellectual property right here uh, between actually Offaly um, and Dublin. Um, so what we've, where we are today is we're live now. We're, we're actually flying from the roof of Tesco in Oranmore. Um, Oranmore has a population of 10,000 people. Uh, we fly from the roof, we're flying today. Um, we fly five days a week and, and we allow customers assembly to open an app and order anything that they want from 25 of the local vendors in Oranmore. So all of the coffee shops, uh, all of the local retailers, the local clothes shop, the local bookshop, um, essentially pretty much every single restaurant in the town uh, and local producer is on our platform. They get a delivery service for free and the customers order through our app and essentially pay us delivery fee. So it, it's a system that, that we like to say enables um, small retailers in suburban communities to get access to that 20 to 50 square kilometers of catchment area within three minutes. Um, and I'm gonna take you through uh, what that experience looks like shortly, but, but first I'd like to show you what, um, what Oranmore looks like for drone delivery. Uh, I hope you can see that now, that screen there, that's satellite view of Oranmore. Each of those orange, orange lines is a delivery flight. Um, we've We've already reached now 36% of the homes in Oran Moor. So more than one in three homes are using our drone delivery service. And if I just zoom in a little bit here and just show you the level of usage we get. Uh, and if I, if I hover over, you'll see there's, everyone will know, Supermax. Um, that's a Brasco coffee, local coffee vendor. And um, that's Thomas & Co, another local coffee vendor. That's Bandido, the local Mexican restaurant. And Tesco Oran Moor. Brasco again, I could go through endlessly. And what you'll see is every single local vendor there reaching 36% of the community. And we work with a combination of the small local vendors and the big guys like Tesco, uh, Coca-Cola, Ben and Jerry's, 
and Samsung. We, we deliver mobile phones, phones from Samsung online here as well. We also power Just Eats delivery uh, for Camille Thai. Um, where we started, and when I think about community, so again, as I said, we, we see ourselves as a service or an infrastructure for communities and essentially giving the community a tool that they can adopt and use in whatever way makes sense. And, and to us, that's to enable commerce, to enable local commerce. Um, the local bookstore in Oranmore today has a better product than Amazon have for the customers in Oranmore. You can order a book online and you can receive it in less than five minutes by drone. And that sounds very crazy, but it works. It's extremely effective. It's green. There's no CO2 produced when we fly. It's private. There's no cameras. There's no equipment recording. There's no customer information. It's secure and safe. There's no strangers on in cars or motorbikes arriving at your front door. And it's scalable. It means that all of that high risk traffic, the high speed traffic to make delivery times happen goes away and robots flying through the air um, replace that. So we, we fully believe that 100% of road based delivery can be replaced with drone based delivery for every category of product. Um, we're currently flying about three kilograms and 30,000 cubic centimeters. And the way to think about that is, you know, about 98% of single basket shops and convenience stores and takeaway restaurants will fit in less than that. Um, and when, you, when it comes to coffee, we routinely do orders of four or five, six cups of coffee. And quite interestingly, more than half of our deliveries today in Oranmore are for coffee, hot coffee, cappuccino, Americano, you name it. And the, the average spend um, through drone delivery of the coffee shops is more than twice what it is in the actual coffee shops themselves. So we already have very strong, very encouraging early signs that um, commerce is turbocharged when you have three minute guaranteed delivery. And we see that in the numbers too, it, not just 36, 37% adoption rate, but also frequency. So we have a cohort of customers now, more than 70% of customers have ordered more than five times. And we have a cohort of customers already over 100 deliveries uh, of all categories, restaurant, coffee, local products. So when you, when you think about what this infrastructure or, or this tool gives to communities, the way we see it is it balances, um, it, it provides a very good balance between urban living and suburban living. And, and, and the kind of one of the triggers for creating this business at the start was you know, as it happens, I live in a suburb of Dublin, not, not a very remote suburb, but five or six miles from the city centre. And there's precious little delivery available to my house. And that's because it's not economically viable to, to use a human being and a, and a car and the road to do deliveries for low basket value goods. It simply doesn't work. And what that does, it constrains demand uh, for local stores, local restaurants and so on. But it also means that suburban living isn't equal to urban living. There, there's tools and there's conveniences that urban dwellers in the middle of Dublin, middle of Cork, middle of Limerick have that the people in Ornmore, Balbriggan, Scaries, you name it, don't have. And the very first town that we operated in was actually Moneygall. Uh, Moneygall is a population of 700 people that in, in not in the next 100 years will it ever get a delivery system that will enable local commerce to happen there. And we spent six months in or more, or sorry, in Money Gall delivering pharmacy, so prescription medicines, delivering critical food supplies, all of that for the local community of six or 700 people that had been asked to, um, to, to lock down, essentially not leave their houses during the thick of the first uh, lockdown. And we were able to provide a service there that, that really was a very, very useful service, particularly for the elderly, elderly and vulnerable. But, but if you forward wine, we think that service is valid for all suburban and, and rural communities across Ireland and actually will, will ultimately give them a better way to get commerce for both vendors and consumers across all of Ireland outside of the city centre of Dublin. So we're very proud of that. We've already got that running and in the next two or three weeks we'll move to our next town which is Balbriggan and Balbriggan will run about three or four uh, aircraft there. E each aircraft will do between 50 and 100 deliveries each per day 
And we aim to do about four or 500 deliveries a day in Balbriggan. And, and there again, we'll fly from the rooftop of the shopping center there, right over Tesco. And we'll be working with about, initially about eight of the local uh, vendors, as well as Tesco itself. And we'll also be bringing three uh, small business coffee brands in there to, to try, uh, try that out. And we expect that to be quite an interesting um, and quite a large scale operation, actually. So, I mean, in, in numbers, we've done about 65,000 flights. Um, we're now the biggest, you know, even though it's still, sm still small, we're, we're the most advanced drone delivery system of its type in the world. Um, and we've done that in less than three years. And that makes us all as a team very, very proud. Um, so when I, when I think about, uh, next, oh, sorry, I need to show you uh, a video of what this actually looks like. And um, I was warned that not everyone knows exactly who uh, man is or what it's about. So what I'm gonna show you is a video of a drone delivery in Oran Moor. Uh, it's an evening one. It's of a Camille Thai uh, to a family of four, two kids, two adults. And it's a little, I'll shut up so that you can see everything happening and I'll, and I'll, I'll talk you through it later. But what you're going to see is the aircraft approaching a, a home in Ormore, full of delicious hot food. Uh, the flight took about two minutes and 30 seconds from where Camille prepared the food. And you'll, you'll hear, when you hear the aircraft, it sounds quite noisy because of the equipment used to record the video. But if you notice, the child's voice, the little girl's voice is actually louder than the drone. So, so noise isn't an issue, even though the video might make, make you think it is. So I'm just going to play the video now, forward wind a little bit, and you'll see the experience. you saw what was going on there the aircraft arrived it flies at 50 meters it arrives overhead of the of the location where we were asked to deliver to it descends to about 15 20 meters and then it hovers it opens the cargo bay doors and it lowers the product down onto the ground and um, using the winch and so a very exciting experience for kids for sure uh, and a circus every delivery and when we roll out to the town, it's literally everyone in the town tries to order at the same time. So it really is a very, very uh, desirable product and, and experience initially. However, we're, we're there 12 months now. And now when we do deliveries um, in Oramore, people don't even come out of their houses to see the drone anymore. In fact, they don't even call it drone delivery there. They just call it delivery um, because that's what it is. At the end of the day, it's fulfilling an actual utility or a function, which is carry products around. Uh, and so while it's very, very exciting initially and drives a lot of early adoption, particularly for jelly snakes, the six-year-olds, it quickly becomes a function and a utility, both for, for suppliers and vendors and, and older customers. Um, so uh, th that's, that's the essence of it. You know, we're definitely in a, in a high risk, uh, high, you know, highly tech deep uh, industry. And we're just over 70 people now in the team, as I've said. And um, we uh, are in Ireland and in Dublin building all of our tech here. And we, we like to think that we're the antidote to Amazon uh, and the antidote to big tech for any country in the world that wants to support their suburban and rural communities and, and provide a bit of equality, a bit of access and plenty of job creation. And, and just on the last point I'd like to make on job creation um, is while, while obviously drone delivery and robots will take away certain uh, roles, 
i.e. driving in, in cars, a uh, bag of chips from a chip or two a home or some broccoli or some pharmacy from a pharmacy to somebody's house, i.e. last mile delivery, that's not a high quality job. It's a job that it, you know, comes with a lot of risk using the roads, a lot of problems generating CO2, a lot of noise. And what we replace it with is business and commerce in local communities that wouldn't exist without drone delivery. So we've already doubled the business of the local coffee shops, for example. And we, we truly believe that when we go to communities and all of the local vendors are on our system, all of those other categories like books, like hardware store, uh, like local vendors of bakeries, butchers, you name it, they're going to have a better product than the big guys will have. And, and that's a structural benefit that you have simply by being located closer to your customer. And the only bit missing is that last mile of transportation that up to now has been expensive and, and impossible actually uh, to make work economically. We are making that work economically and we're, we're very proud to do that. Um, but with that, uh, Paul, I'll, I'll hand back to you. We can maybe uh, ask you some of the questions. Yeah, I, I just have one before myself, because obviously you're doing it from a community point of view, and it's really interesting to see the behavioral change in communities and restaurants that can deliver. It's, I remember you saying to me ages ago, you know, burgers and pizzas do well on the back of bikes because they can survive for half an hour to 45 minutes. But when you can do a two or three minute delivery, it opens up to so much more, not just in the food space, but, you know, delicate yeah. stuff and, uh, and everything else. So obviously it is about community empowerment. But if we could extrapolate out what are amazon and google doing what's the wider drone thing are they even just a different category of thing to what you're trying to do or mm. what are the comparables yeah um so google x or alphabet's x and uh, google's parent alphabet have their x projects and one of them is what called wing aviation and it's a drone delivery program just like we are they have a fantastic uh product and they're live in australia at the moment in one town in australia um, I wouldn't say a bad word about them. They have great tech, a great team. We've actually hired a bunch of their team now, actually, and they work for MANA. One of, one of them is on my board, and one of them runs our US operation. So we know them well. We're close to them. We cooperate. We talk to each other. Um, you know, This business is a very collaborative one because in the end, we're going to be sharing the airspace with each other, so it's important that we work together. Um, so, so they're very active. They've, they've invested over $600 million in their program, so they're, they're taking it quite seriously. Uh, it, it's a particular project that, that Sergey Brin himself is interested in and is involved in um, and has invested in himself. Uh, so it's serious and it's real, but it's constrained by being in the United States. And the reason it's constrained is that um, the FAA or the regulatory environment in, in the USA isn't, hasn't matured yet uh, to support what we're doing, whereas in, in Ireland, particularly with the IAA, we have a really good environment for developing a drone business and that's using the airspace and regulated by the aviation authority, but where the aviation authority actually wants it to work and is engaging on a very, I won't say commercial basis, but a very proactive basis that, you know, with, with a lot of will wants this to happen. And that's key. So funnily, you know, what I, I would point to Ireland and, and maybe one or two other countries in the world that have this advantage where there's a regulator that's present and, and really pushing the space forward. And that's why, to be honest with you, that's the biggest advantage we have being in Ireland. Um, yeah. So that's uh, Google. And then Amazon, you know, Amazon are going to do drone delivery. Uh, they've had a few hiccups. They've had a few false starts. But Amazon don't think and don't need to think about commercial expediency when it comes to getting drone delivery live because their customers themselves, it's, it's Amazon Prime uh, with drone delivery or Amazon Prime Air is what they call it. They'll get it right and, and they'll, they'll do it very well, probably in five or six years. They're not going to rush to it. They recently closed down their UK operation, which, you know, of 150 people, which you know, a lot of people interpreted as being them backing away from drone delivery. Not at all. They've, they've six or 700 people in Seattle working on drone delivery to our 70 um, obviously deeper pockets, both of those companies have deeper pockets and um, unlimited pockets, in fact. Um, but I'm very confident that, you know, we're not going to be held back by them. If, if anything, uh, they're good for us because they open a lot of regulatory doors and do a lot of the upfront work. That yeah, we I, I saw um, Jeff Bezos in New York uh, yesterday was 
committed 10 billion to a green fund as well. So he knows he has to decarbonize them. 100%. Yeah. Bring it. Take two ton vehicles and off the road. Uh, yeah. We've half answered Cormac's first question about Balbriggan starting in a few weeks' time, um, how soon we see it inside the M50. Uh, and I suppose you would say you would see it in aspects with inside the M50. It's just not going to be city centre, right? It's about suburbs where 80%. Yeah. Of yeah, we, we actually think we can reach about, the data we have points to about 2 million people accessible in Ireland for the service. So I think every suburb above 10 to 15,000 people and, you know, so, but below city centre. And the, the, the constraint is simply, we need a two metre diameter flat space to deliver on that our customers can access. That That's really the constraint. So you know, Dublin's not great. Dublin city centre is obviously not great for that. I think about Pier Street, the, the roofs of the apartment buildings aren't accessible, so yeah. they don't work. But Tala, for example, is perfect. And we're looking forward to rolling out in Tala and Scaries and Nace and everywhere. And we, we plan to, for Ireland to be the first country in the world to have ubiquitous drone delivery. Uh, but first we need to crawl, then walk, then run. And for us, Balbriggan is the next big step of, of layers of the onion. So Balbriggan is where we will do about four or 500 deliveries a day. And, and that lets us just iron out the, the last remaining um, unknowns about the service, around what engagement looks like, what products we need to have, and you know, kind of operational things that break when you're doing that many deliveries. Yeah, the second second half of Cormac's question actually, because you 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 I know you started almost with the IIA and and they held your hand through this process because you were building your own yeah. aircraft as well with all the levels of redundancy and everything else. That uh, it was new territory for both them and you as as it developed from Money Gold to and more to yeah. Balfrigan. Before I before I hired a single person, I met the IIA to to discuss what what the environment was like would they be receptive would they be supportive would it did would this ever be legal would it ever be regulated to be legal and it was the IAA that that confirmed uh, my belief that Ireland is the place to build its business and that it is going to happen it's coming and they're you know what, what I won't say is hugely supportive is the wrong word but they believe in it and they want the they want the airspace to be liberalized and commercialized it, it's a it's a national asset, just like our, our spectrum is for mobile phone companies. This is an asset that the country has um, on one hand. So it, need, it should be regulated for safety. And so they're usually supporting and it was the IAA that issued our European wide license. So we have a license now European wide. And um, so what we're doing in Oran Moore and what we've been doing in Balbriggan, we can do anywhere in Europe now with that license that they've yeah. issued. And it's the first of its kind issued in Europe. And um, so IAA are, are very, very strong uh, partners in this. Yeah. And actually, Samuel has a follow-up question. Because you took investment from the UK, Brexit, I know there's a huge opportunity in the UK, it being 10x the size. And the, I think they have the, is it the highest rate of takeaways in the, yeah. in the world? God bless them. Uh, yeah. Their cardiologists must be thrilled. Um, but Brexit and subsequent barriers to trade, that not an issue for you? Yeah, we can deliver statins, just your point on, on that. Um, and yeah. No, UK market is bigger than the rest of Europe combined, and it wow. dwarfs it. So, so UK does 850 million uh, road trips for food every year, and that's growing at about 15%. And, you know, typical calories, Chinese, Indian, pizza, burgers, and fries. So, so they're, they have a phenomenal uh, appetite for delivery, not just for, for food, um, but for everything. And so, so there are key target market outside of the USA they're our biggest market and yeah Brexit has, has kind of cast a not a shadow but an uncertainty around timeline but nevertheless we, we do have an office in Wales we actually have funding support from the Welsh Development Authority and we have team over there so we, we are absolutely all over the UK and we're actively looking for a Balbriggan like town in the UK to do and we're working with the CAA uh, the Aviation Authority over there to get that done. And the amount of VC money that's flowing into 15 minute delivery from dark stores and all that. I mean, yeah. only, imagine only you guys can solve that. Right. So we, well, you know, we think 15 minutes is too slow. I mean, a, a burger and fries or a coffee, 15 minutes doesn't work. You mm -hmm. need to be two to three minutes. And that's what we're doing. So we, we actually think that we're, you know, a, a, an order of magnitude more important than those current companies that are generating billions of dollars of investment. 
Your views are well known on this next question. Shanna uh, has asked, uh, should they be doing more to support SMEs, those in high tech, investing more in R&D? Yeah, I think they they should. Uh, you know, for, firstly, uh, I think, you know, we're uh, an indigenous company, so we're supported by Enterprise Ireland. And, and I couldn't speak highly enough of Enterprise Ireland. And similarly, you know, I have to tip my hat to IDA, to the great work that the IDA are doing and bringing jobs in. But there is a misbalance in, in strategy here. We put too much emphasis on FDI and not enough emphasis on indigenous companies. And, you know, the, the, the simple fact that our, basically our R&D grants, you know, can't be drawn down within, it takes three years to draw them down. That's literally of zero use to a startup company, no use whatsoever. And it just benefits large companies that are already profitable. That, that's not a startup device, that's a device for large companies. So I think uh, for SMEs, you know, while there's great work being done by Enterprise Ireland, uh, I think policy needs work. And I think, you know, you know, the entities like Scale Ireland that I'm a part of, you know, are going a long way towards having that conversation with government. It's early days yet, but I'd certainly like to see some of the policy issues addressed there to, you know, otherwise all of our IP, or the ownership of everything that we're building in Ireland as SMEs ultimately will be owned by American or British companies. And I'm just going to skip over, but come back to another question. But in terms of the skills gaps and what government should be doing, you know, how do we encourage women and minorities to enter into high tech? How important is employee participation in equity? Uh, all of that stuff. That is being addressed by some by some entities, right? Yeah, it is. Um, you, you know, in fact, and I'd like just to be very clear in terms of policy, uh, the, the one that gets the headline a lot is capital gains tax. And that's not going to that, that doesn't have any impact on, on what companies like like my company does. What we're interested in is how, how can we get support for employees to make to allow us to compete with FDI companies? And, and so, so example, Amazon, HubSpot, uh, Zalando, I, I could list a bunch of IDA backed companies that take incentives, headcount grants, and, and all sorts of other tax incentives and use them to inflate salaries. And indigenous companies cannot compete with that. So we need, we need the, the playing field leveled. And we, we simply can't compete on a salary basis with those companies. They just, there's, there's no way of touching them, which is fine. So the way to do that is, or the way to enable that is with stock options or, or to address that is with stock options mm -hmm. and, and really efficient abilities for small startup companies to take risk and for their employees to take risk in lieu of salary, but without losing out. So to, to keep all of the normal PAYE benefits, but also to be allowed to issue stock options um, as efficiently as our friends uh, a little bit east of us already. Yeah, because your tax day one on stock options here, when no one knows if they're actually worth anything or not, right? So I mean, yeah, it's correct, so, correct. But it's you know what I, quite honestly, most employees in Ireland aren't aware of the impact, and they they don't know this. It's just it, it's just a disparity between markets where you know when I think about who's setting strategy, who's setting policy, that to me is an indicator that we don't care enough about SMEs. So we're not at a policy level actually thinking about what SMEs need because I, my employees aren't complaining about the tax, you know, the, the, the mismatch, the, the lack of balance. They, they don't think about that. They're excited about building. They're mostly young. They're taking risks. But I, I would find it really difficult to hire a 40-year-old that has children and a mortgage and ask them to take a salary cut instead of going to Google or Amazon or Facebook, you know, I just, and I need those people, but I, I can't touch the FDI back companies with incentives because of the way we're structured. So, you know, it, it signals to me or smoke that means there's a fire that the Department of Finance are not thinking about SMEs in the way that perhaps they could. And, and that's fine. There is forward movement there. And I'm very thankful for that. But, but as I said, we need a lobby and Scale Ireland recently have taken up that lobby and then are doing a great job in that regard. Yeah, it's probably been that it's been not as coherent. You know, they can see the 150,000 FDI jobs and they see them as a block. Yeah. No, let's not risk yeah. it. Let's not risk it. Whatever they need, although there might be some risks coming down. Yeah, there totally. totally. We, 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 you know, the tech community here, the indigenous community have never had a lobby. We've never been organized. And we, we kind of just get on with it, right? We take the risk, we get on with it. But you know, when I look at Israel, you know, if you just compare Israel, 13 unicorns to Ireland's three, 
uh, 15 billion in fresh capital gone into Israeli companies last year compared to our three or four. So it just, you know, it's policy that makes that happen. And yeah. I, you know, I asked a question on Twitter a few days ago, you've probably seen, you know, uh, why can't Ireland have a trillion dollar company? Why are we thinking so small? Why do we have to keep getting owned by American companies? Why do we sell out? The reason is we don't have policy here to keep indigenous companies on that track. Is there, a, you know, is there a maturity of venture capital as well, or is that is that fair? I see someone has asked, you know, has our own NTMA shown interest in investing? You know, I mean, they probably have indirectly because they're in so many funds. But yeah, yeah, right. the NTMA are they're awesome. They they're really a fantastic bunch of people, really big guns, and they are they're, they're indirectly invested through it. They're an LP in in Draper, so you know, Ireland is definitely on the cap table of Mana. You know. But if you think outside of it, because I'm lucky enough, I have kind of some success in my past, so it's easier for me to get international financing. But when I think about, you know, the, the younger, less experienced CEOs that don't have that track record and they're trying to start up here, their go to is Enterprise Ireland, you know, the match funding and then friends and family. And there you look at EIS and, and you look at policy around that. There's so much capital in Ireland sloshing around looking for a home that right now is going into property that should be going into techs. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, you know, but, you know, uh, the, the guys, um, you know, Alan Merriman of Elkstone and their fund is a classic example of probably 50 to hundred million euros that would be going into tech startups if we had the right policy. So it's not that VC isn't mature here, that there's, there's some policy, small policy changes that could happen. And, and I know, when, when we met Pascal yeah, Donahue at the, uh, the Minister of Finance, sorry, at the uh, recent Scale Iron event, he alluded to perhaps some change in that regard. But what I would like to say that there should be two firm shoulders put behind that. And we should be looking at why is Enterprise Ireland really the high risk backer of startups here? Why don't we have big VC funds coming in here or indigenous funds coming from property maybe into uh, high risk funds? So that's policy. And I, I think we can do a little bit of work there. Yeah, because if you look at the acts or the deltas and front lines of the guys, they are, I suppose, act is on its sixth fund now. So there's a little bit of we're we're about twenty or thirty years behind Silicon Valley. I yeah, mean, but but, just, but look yeah. at look at none of none of those guys are in Mana. You know, Mana is one of those. Mana is a great example, and this isn't a personal thing, but it's a terrific sure. example. It's a super high risk bet. And and VC in Ireland, it's really strong, great bunch of people, but it, it's kind of it's not at that. It, it's kind of show me your momentum. First, do your seed round, you know, Enterprise Ireland, a bit of friends and family. There isn't this. I love it. Here's twenty million dollars. Give it a go. Yeah. Look, look what Shane Kern did with Evervault. Sequoia came running in, gave him nineteen million euros. That's what needs to happen in Ireland. We should be able to have coffee in town and meet those people here and not wait for them to fly over. Like I've got aircraft flying off the roof of Tesco and Balbriggan. Where's all the VCs coming to look at that with 20, 50, $100 million to bet? They're just not here. So, so it's definitely, that's a function of our size in the economy as well. Yeah. And, and certainly, NT, I have had lots of chats with NTMA and they, they're very supportive. And, and ultimately as we raise money, they'll be there. I know that they will be, as will the European Investment Bank and a bunch of other European style things. but. There isn't that, you know, head off to chapter one or done with Crescenzi's and, and ink a $20 million deal. That doesn't exist in Ireland. It does exist in Tel Aviv. Yeah. Actually, it, it brings me back to another question about um, uh, someone just asked, uh, I'm being slightly tongue in cheek here, but uh, drones have had a bad image because of their military use. Has that affected you? I'd say it's more the personal drones than the military use in this. Yeah, per yeah personal drones are far more. Uh, problematic you know so, so people invading you know their neighbors privacy they're going in with a little drone regulation will take care of all that so i'm not that concerned about that yeah. and, you know in ireland we we certainly have huge support like the, the last survey we ran with 98 percent positive rating of people you know anonymously by the way people that said yes if you bring drone delivery i want drone delivery so Ireland at least is very positive towards it not and that's not to do with mana that's just whatever Ireland wants drone delivery but if you go to the UK that number is about 65 percent and that's caused by the incident at Gatwick airport you know and things like that so it, it is a delicate balance of you have to respect you know the community and, and if we're asking to fly over their airspace 
to do deliveries. And if they don't want it, then, you know, if someone's in there that doesn't want their own delivery, we have to respect them. We can't just say tough shit, everybody else wants it. So we have to think about noise. We have to think about all sorts of things around people that don't want the service and respect that because this is not like using the roads or putting scooters on where everyone's involved. Like if you choose to walk on the footpath, you're involved, right? You know, with scooters, you know, or cross the road for that matter. But if you're just in your back garden, reading your newspaper, enjoying the sun and tranquility and a drone flies over, you didn't, you're not involved and you didn't ask for that. So we have to be really, really careful about respecting people's privacy, respecting people's, people's tranquility, and of course, respecting their safety. And so it's a, it's a very, very delicate uh, industry that we're yeah, in. You, they, they, this was John Holmes' uh, follow-up question, safety issues, heavier items hitting people, dangerous product falling into the wrong hands, prescriptions, yeah. et cetera. There's an element here as well, and I know, God forgive us, uh, we're both Tesla drivers, you were the big one and me with a small one. Um, but you know, you, you only ever hear the horror stories, not the displacement of business as usual. So many people are killed in scooter accidents, you know, bike yeah. riding accidents tend to be delivery riders, all that stuff. But there are issues around here that you have addressed, isn't there, in terms of safety? Yeah, I mean, like just on, yeah, you're right. The alternative is using the road, using motorbikes, using scooters, using cars to, to, to use the road. And, and there's a lot of data on this, but two, two interesting points. A delivery food delivery driver is six times more likely to be in an accident on the road than any other driver six times more likely and and just last year in, in amsterdam just amsterdam 88 food delivery drivers were carried in ambulances to hospital with critical injuries as a result of their job so we don't think that's a good thing we think the alternative our alternative is far better and then secondly safety is you know the, our product or our goal today is not commercial it's safety and we have to show the regulator that we can fly a million, 10 million flights a day uneventually, in other words, completely safely. So we have a very unusual aircraft. It's got all of the systems that a big Airbus would have. It's got fly-by-wire, it's got triple flight computers, triple battery redundancy, propulsion redundancy, all of these things to make sure that it can never have a problem. Uh, if it had a bird strike, all sorts of things that can go wrong, we test for. We have a bog in Offaly, four miles by four miles. We test all of this. And finally, we have a parachute on the aircraft that if the worst happens and there's an independently powered, independent processor controlled pyrotechnic parachute like an airbag that deploys and would bring the aircraft down to the ground. But saying that we've had so far 65,000 flights, uneventful, no issues whatsoever. But we, we won't scale this business until we have at least half a million successful flights on the clock. So it's the same as an airline safety standard. Essentially. Safer. It has to be safer because there's more volume. So at scale, we'll be running a million to 10 million flights a day. If we're, if we're successful, we're a trillion dollar company. We'll be doing one to 10 million flights a day. So that's in, that's multiple orders of magnitude, more volume than Ryanair will fly. So we actually have to be safer. Cool. Bring it back to, because I, I felt like I cut you off in your prime there, you know, the, the 20 million check up in, Dunnikersenzies, and just because we happen to know that's where one check was handed over. Um, in your opinion, what policy or policies could help your business the most? Is there an element or have we missed a trick? Because everyone says about Israel, and I don't know if it's cliche or not, is they have the military industrial complex that lands to research, but they also, when they have the intels there and the Cisco's and everything else, they tend to be the kind of execs that buy and, you know, that they, yeah. they subsume into their business there. Whereas I think in Ireland, and maybe I'm wrong here, maybe in pharma or something, it's different, but we tend to have siloed businesses that don't tend to buy local technology companies that create the, you know, ecosystem that people can go again and then maybe stand on the whole way to an IPO or whatever. What do you think is missing? Um, it, it's, a, it's a tricky one. I actually don't think about my own business in that regard. I think about smaller business startups, you know, concerning my last business and the business before that, I, I think more than, than MANA. Um, and I think the Israelis, you know, have a university uh, output that, that's really great, but they also have a much more fragmented startup environment down there. So they don't have these gigantic, big FDI companies hoovering up all the talent. And so when I look at the biggest, if, if I could solve, if I only had one wish, I, I would, I would multiply the output from our technical universities by, you know, uh, um, some multiple of three to five, 
and I would, I would cool the afterburners on bringing gigantic companies in to Dublin to hire all that talent coming out of universities. We've overheated the market. There aren't enough tech people to go around. And the ones that lose out disproportionately to that are the indigenous companies. So we either increase output from the universities or we decrease the demand from inbound FDI companies. The job market is overheated. We don't need any more big companies coming to Dublin to hire those people. Yeah, I, I saw something recently. Was it Cambridge or Oxford or, or close to here where they've, they have a new streamlined IP thing? It's probably still too much, but if there's no IP involved, but it got invented in university, it's 10%. I saw that, IP, yeah. It's up to 20%. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a little too blunt, but... Yeah, like, like Trinity, you know, UCD, uh, you know, they're, they're really great organizations, but they're just two universities. We need more. And if you look at what... There's a, there's a recent initiative in the University of Limerick, the Immersive Software uh, Engineering degree. So it's a degree, um, you know, un underwritten by the University of Limerick, supported by MANA. Uh, John Collison is the chairman of it, and a bunch of Irish companies have put their weight behind this. And, and it's going to produce a kind of new generation of what I would call entrepreneurial commercial programmers. So it's not your typical degree. They're going to be spending six to nine months of their year in organizations like MANA Learning the trade of both building business and, and technology. So we need more of that. And I don't think there's a lack of willingness from government to, to, to invest there. I just think we need a little bit more time. We're, we are behind on that. But I think if I was the folk, if, if Ireland had a CTO, that's what he or she would be doing, I think, is spinning up those initiatives to, to create more output. And then I'd have a polite conversation with IDA to not be so successful. <laughs> Well, that's a hard thing, hard conversation to have with anyone. Yeah, I, I really feel if Stephen Kinsler and, and UL Immersive, it's called, isn't it? I think UL Immersive. Right. Yeah. Leave, your, leave the immersive on. Uh, if that's yeah. successful, it could be replicated out to every corner in the country. Yeah, I'd love that. Yeah, yeah. And we'll start that's, seeing benefits. Just on much. equality, there was, a, there was a, there's something you brought up on equality there. You know, again, you know, down to, you know, both cultural uh, diversity um, you know, and, and no females in technology as well. Th those are two massive issues that, you know, are, are, they're hard to see, right? So, it, for example, when we go to Balbriggan, 50% of the local people we hire will be, um, will be from direct provision. And that's one way that companies like us can start to change that balance. But again, policy there would be helpful. It would be helpful if we could, you know, if, if there could be a bit of positive discrimination there through policy. And then on the other, the female gap in technology is one I've never understood. Uh, we try our hardest, but there's a big gap there. And I think that's where bigger companies that come into Ireland or bigger companies that are already in Ireland do much better than smaller companies that get the gender balance correct. It's something we try very hard at in MANA. In, in Car Trawler, in my last business, we had 600 people and 53% of them are female. But, you know, if I look at MANA now, you know, we have, I think, six females out of a team of 75. And that's not because we're not looking. It's because we just don't have access to that talent. How do you think, uh, sorry, there's a quick one here from Cormac again, the, the 2kg max payload, or will that increase? I mean, you're, you're within a certain range and weight payload, right? Yeah, no, that, that choice is intentional. It's actually 3kg now. Our new aircraft is 3kg and 30,000 cubic centimetres. So... I could um, eat three kg in one delivery. I, I know you could. Yeah, that's yeah. a large sandwich. Yeah. Um, so, so we we've kind of there's a method or madness here. You know, three kg and thirty thousand cubic centimeters. Te Tesco have twenty eight thousand individual products in their store. We can now carry nineteen and a half thousand of those products. So we think that addresses the choice. You know, your typical meal. So so everyone knows. A Chinese average weight of a Chinese or Indian meal is, is 750 grams, and that's the heaviest meal you'll get. So we've intentionally chosen three kilos to get to that. And it's also uh, five pints, even though we don't serve alcohol. Um, so, you know, we've, we've chosen our weight, volume, distance, and wind speed all very carefully to reach more than 90% of demand and to be able to fly, most importantly, to be able to fly in 99% of Irish weather because if we plan to replace, completely replace road-based delivery, we better be able to fly all of the time. Yeah, it's actually a great test bed, Ireland, isn't it? It's about <laughs> as bad as the world control action. It's too, it's too great. We'd be better off on bloody Mars. 
But that's why they all the rest of them are flying in Arizona and all the yeah. testing and all that. And yeah. it doesn't, it's not real world. Yeah, no, like we, we fly in today, we fly in 13 meters per second winds in, in our test facility in the ball. 13 meters per second is about uh, times three and a half. It's about 50 kilometer an hour winds. And when you have to hover in 50 kilometer hour winds with a 20 kilo aircraft, that's not easy. And those 65,000 flights we have are really strengthening our ability to scale anywhere. And the test, of course, is that the coffee, the little design on the coffee stays intact when it gets delivered. You know the line well. You know the line well. Me, yeah. It gives me great hope that you won't spill the creamy pint head either. We, you know, we, we deliver not just coffee with the little design intact. We also deliver fresh eggs. You know, a lot of smart people in our communities think that they can, you know, trick us. But And so they order fresh eggs with their coffee or with their Monster Munch or whatever it is. And uh, we regularly deliver six fresh eggs without cracking them, I'm pleased to say. Yep. Can I just just to finally ask, I mean, you've overcome loads of regulatory framework stuff, technical stuff. Obviously, you can see from the even version one behind you. But behavioral, where do you see communities if you're successful uh, in terms of what you're doing? And obviously, going to Balbriggan is the equivalent of any, you know, small American suburb or, or, or UK suburb. What will actually change? You've alluded to, you know, it can keep the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, the book seller going but how does this change does it mean like much much better environmental flow on the ground but also you know what what's your vision for yeah. a sustainable community in five years time when you become ubiquitous yeah and um, so so firstly to, to really understand this you have to and don't do it now but do it after the call think about when you're sitting at home and you need something uh how do you get it you know right now either don't get it, which is nine times out of 10, yeah. or you jump in your car, you drive down to Tesco or Super Value, whatever, you grab it and then you pick up a load of stuff that you didn't need, you drive home and, and that's the process. So the, the future we see is everything that you need, you can get through an app online with a local vendor and it arrives at your house in less than five minutes. And we, we also think that that's not going to cost you an arm and a leg either. We think we can power that in a way that doesn't take away much from your pocket. Um, and secondly, to today, 30% of food is wasted around the world. And the reason that happens is because we go to supermarkets, we have gigantic big trolleys, and we fill them. We overbuy, food waste happens, and it gets thrown out. When you, when you have a three-minute delivery service, you can purchase in a more granular, more frequent way, i.e. on demand, exactly what you need. When Less you anxiety, in a way. Less anxiety, yeah. So like, it goes to that broccoli order I always love to talk about. You know, the person that orders the broccoli at 6 p.m. because they didn't have broccoli. Um, that's the kind of thing we want the power. But, but going forward in, in five years, as you say, when we're ubiquitous, we think that fridges can shrink. Uh, we think that food waste can go away. We think that gigantic big stores where gigantic big weekly shops that are quite inefficient, quite a waste of time and quite expensive can go away. Uh, and we just think behavior, once once people are trained and once people understand how reliable the service can be for them and how quickly they can get things, you know, it takes a long time to change consumers' behavior, consumers' habits, long time. So as we roll out over the next three to five years, there'll be a latency to that to that kind of behavior catching up. But, but you know, you forward wind again five years plus there will be no more road-based journeys for those convenience store, the single basket, the what have we got in the fridge for dinner tonight? Why don't you head out and pick up some chicken or some vegetables, whatever. It'll be all supplied by local vendors, local brands, local businesses, local jobs, getting to that community within three minutes. And then you forward on even further. And then you think about someone that wants to work at home making jewelry or selling books or making cakes or whatever it is. That person can have a job and make a lot of money selling to their local community with a delivery service that gets them there. And then I think about all of those local businesses that are threatened by the likes of Amazon and any other big giant aggregators. You know, we're the antidote to that. If you give businesses a way to reach customers efficiently, then they're going to take advantage of that and they'll thrive. And consumer behavior will adopt. Consumers want to buy local. They want to buy from somebody that they know, from business that they know. And, and, and we think that that's the future. It's a highly fragmented suburban landscape of retailers and consumers. Uh, two last questions, Brian Caulfield, uh, first time listener, long time uh, talker. Uh, have you spoken to any of the 10 minute grocery delivery, the dark store 
chaps in the UK. Yeah, we have. Uh, actually, honestly, we've spoken to everybody and, and they've been inbounding us. Everyone wants to learn about drone delivery. So all of the those 10 minute platforms and actually one of them, I won't name them, one of them wants to come to Balbriggan and do a dark store with us in Balbriggan. Um, so so we're, we're, we're working through that. And we definitely want to learn, but at the same time, we need to understand first what, what real demand looks like to see how it maps onto them. But there's probably not one of them that haven't been bound to both the big aggregators yeah. and, and the smaller, newer 10 minute guys. And don't forget, uh, we have one of the founders of Delivery Hero on our cap table as well, Lukas Gadowski. So, so we have a bit of uh, delivery DNA. We also won the founders of Rappi on our cap table, the, the, Colombian and, and Latin American delivery system. Um, so, so there's no amount, uh, there, there's unlimited amount of interest from all of those guys, but we're too small. We don't have the, the energy or the resources to engage with them just yet, but we, we'll be ready in about 12 months. To start. And of course, I, I saw you in a huddle with uh, Devin from By Me here as well, you know, the Irish homegrown guys as yeah. well. And, yeah, uh, yeah Devin's great. He's got the <laughs> right idea. Imagine, imagine if Devin had drones. Um, th there's a marriage to be made you know, with all of those types of business, and I'd like nothing more than to work it's with scary. I've got the quick fire ones here. Some of them have been answered. Lee asks, are the drones able to fly in bad weather? Yes. Yeah, yeah horrible weather, uh, wind, rain, fog, everything, yeah. Uh, is there a way for individuals to invest in Manit, crowdfunding or similar? It's probably a little too late now, but... No, we, we, we don't uh, it, uh, We don't take private money, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, would you ever do a subscription service with unlimited deliveries? Four pounds per delivery is grand for one-offs, but couldn't be afforded a few times a day. It's yeah. an inter the discussion, isn't it, with, with yeah, no. the retailers? I, I think I think we will. Ultimately, I think this is a service just like broadband. I think everyone's going to have it. They're going to need it. And, and we'll figure out a way that once drone delivery arrives, you subscribe to it or, or that gets funded somehow by local retailers and it becomes just that kind of, that, that, that pipe that you use to move goods around. And we don't think it's, well, I mean, certainly people are willing to pay, you know, three, four, five euros now for delivery, but we want people to get their coffee every day. We want them to get their, we want them to shop every single day in their local community for just what they need. So that frequency is going to drive a requirement yeah. to have a subscription. Because, because that, the, 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 the thing that the, all the VCs in the delivery platforms as it is, hasn't figured out is if there's a human in the chain, it's just going to cost, a minimal cost every time anyway and rightly so yeah so, yeah I mean, no what, what, I, what i'd say to cormac there is look we, we, we we'll start with something like co coffee is is the highest frequency purchase that mankind makes now mm. um outside of electricity and gas uh so that that's where we'll start and we think that kind of subscription all you can eat all you can drink whatever is probably what we'll test and we'll test that in balbriggan so you yeah. should move to balbriggan uh, you've heard it here first. There's one last question from some guy, Ricard Ford. What is Bobby's favorite piece of media coverage he's gotten to date? No, I, I, it was when I nearly got married to same Ricard Ford in Vegas. Yeah, I can't believe there are ringers on this site. Your your actual know, PR guy, look at the back. My actual PR guy asked me a question. Uh, <laughs> so all of the PR that that uh, Richard Ford has arranged, obviously. That's it. The sun, the sun you had in Vegas. Okay, I think that's been fantastic. I don't know, Shanna or, or John, do you want to jump in uh, and, and wrap us up? Or uh, I just want to say thanks to Bobby. I found it fascinating and I should have known most of this. Uh, and I hope it was uh, educational and entertaining and exciting uh, for people. And uh, oh, look, I can wrap up. There we go. And thanks for answering all the questions. I actually don't think we skipped one question. We even went for the controversial ones. There you go. Yeah, we that's did. Yep. Bobby, thanks very much. Thanks, everyone, for uh, coming in. And see you all soon again. Thank you. Influence that government. Indeed. Thanks, Bobby. Let's do this. Bye-bye. Good luck. Bye-bye.